Hi everyone, I'm Obliquity. I'm from London. Um, apologies for the terrible state of my voice. I'm aware that it sounds horrible at the moment. I've had a COVID test which thankfully came back negative, but I still have a lot of the symptoms. Um, I'm recording this in advance in case it's too painful to speak on the day, and uh, I'm doing that in parts so that I'm not having to talk for too long at a time. So if there's an awkward transition somewhere, that'll be why. I'm also recording in the daytime on a weekday, which means there's a bit of noise around at the moment. Um, as you can probably hear at the moment, there's a plane taking off. I'm next to Heathrow Airport. Uh, I'm also next to a construction site. Um, I'll do my best to edit out any strange noises or coughing fits. The meta that I'll be talking about today uh, is the idea of Crowley having been Raphael. Uh, it's a fairly popular theory by this point. I'm sure that any of you who have read a decent amount of fan fiction have come across it already. A while back now, I posted a theory on Tumblr about the possibility of Raphael never having actually existed in the Good Omens universe. The idea was that the similarity to Aziraphale's name was the result of Crowley trying to make up a name on the spot while doing good deeds and unable to use his own. I also kind of liked the idea that neither Crowley or Aziraphale had ever been anybody of importance, for lack of a better term. A fallen angel named Gadriel is credited in at least one source with the temptation of Eve, which I like to think was the result of Crowley taking credit for the sword being given away, and I was quite happy with all of that. But when I started planning what's turned into a 28 and counting chapter fan fiction, I wanted to do a little more research so that I'd at least have a prior identity in the back of my mind while writing Crowley, and so that I could drop in little hints as to what it might have been. I was aware of the Raphael theory and knew that a few things fit, but I hadn't quite realised how much evidence there is up to this point. I won't have time to go through everything in full detail now, um, because there's so much of it and we have limited time. But at some point in the near future I'll post the whole thing on Tumblr or Twitter for anyone who's interested enough to trawl through it all. Before I get into it I have to give credit to the Reading Lemon on Tumblr, that's the hyphen reading hyphen lemon and their roommate for the post with the original theory. It turns out I'm in a Discord server with them and hadn't realised. So as a lot of us know, Raphael is an archangel and a healer. His name means God heals or God please heal. The root of the name could possibly come from the Hebrew word rof, uh, meaning a medicine doctor, or else rapak, meaning God heals the soul. Various sources list anything up to 15 or 16 archangels, with Raphael, Michael, Uriel and Gabriel being the most frequently seen names, hence everybody wondering where he is in Good Omens. For example, a Jewish apocryphal book called The Life of Adam and Eve names these four and another named Joel, whereas the Book of Enoch lists Michael, Gabriel, Raphael and Phanuel. These overlapping or alternative lists have led to some confusion over which names are the equivalent of other names on different lists. So we have Uriel being given Fanuel as an alternative name in some sources, for example, but others equate Uriel to Jeremiah, Serial, uh, even Azrael, aka Death, and Raphael himself. Raphael is most often depicted carrying a staff about which a snake is coiled, and such a staff appears in the Bible constructed by Moses. Numbers chapter 21, verses 8 to 9 says... Then God said to Moses, Make a seraph figure and mount it on a standard. And if anyone who is bitten looks at it, he shall recover. Moses made a copper serpent and mounted it on a standard. And when anyone was bitten by a serpent, he would look at the copper serpent and recover. Just a side note here, the word seraph means both serpent and burning one. And the words are used interchangeably throughout the Bible. There are several accounts from different sources in the Middle East and Northern Africa that describe deadly flying serpents. The Egyptians referred to the flaming one, uh, the image of which was worn by pharaohs, which means that seraph may be an old Hebrew name for a cobra. The species worn has been identified as a black-necked cobra, and they don't fly, um, although some Asian species of snake can glide. But they do sit in trees and attack from above, and they look like this. Now, stories can spread, but this is primarily a sub-Saharan species. They would not generally be in Egypt, let alone in the Sinai or Arabian peninsulas, and there aren't usually many trees in the average desert to dive out of. In Egyptian iconography, there is also a winged serpent whose wings symbolise protection. So both accounts paint the snake as both a protector and endangerer of life. Seraph is also used to refer to a type of angel, and Raphael is said to be one in multiple sources. It's one of the upper ranks in the sphere associated with creation, which is also called the higher garden of Eden, and also with wisdom, understanding and the asking of questions. 
Crowley and Aziraphale were each given a thematic decorative pin to hold their togas together in Rome by the lovely Claire Anderson, who you'll be able to hear from tomorrow. And the precise term for Crowley's used in the companion book is a serpent and staff. The staff most often depicted in art is this one, which is generally accepted to be the universal symbol of healthcare. But in fact, this staff belongs to the Greek god Hermes and represents commerce. Take that as you will. But Greek myth has also adapted the correct staff, which was known to them as the Rod of Asclepius, who was the Greek god of medicine and the healing arts, and which featured only one snake. His temples were used to shelter the sick, and this is probably um, one of the earliest examples we have of um, something that we would now recognise as a hospital. Whenever one opened, non-poisonous snakes were placed inside and allowed to move around freely. This is probably because the shedding of a snake's skin was seen as a symbol of rejuvenation. Raphael is also often associated with Anubis, uh, Egyptian god of mummification and the afterlife, lost souls and helpless. Also Buddha, Iris, Greek personification of the rainbow. Loki, the gender-fluid Norse trickster, and Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom. Each of these figures bear some similarities or associations with Crowley, but the most interesting of them is Loki. And a Loki-like non-Crowley Raphael appears in the fiction Demons of the Caribbean, um, written by Caspian, who's on the genders and queer coding panels. It's excellent. I can't recommend it enough. A lot of people are aware of Loki being uh, gender-fluid, uh, probably Pan and a shapeshifter, um, but he's also associated himself with Prometheus and Tantalus from Greek myth. These two are bound and punished severely for giving forbidden things and or knowledge to humankind. Prometheus took fire from the gods and gifted it to the humanity he had formed out of clay, while Tantalus told of forbidden secrets he had learned in the realm of the gods and brought nectar and ambrosia. Crowley didn't create humans, but he did help to make them what they are, and of course he knows all about forbidden foods. Loki himself on the surface of it was bound for killing another god, but some theorised that it was equally if not entirely due to the other gods being offended when Loki called them out on their own wrongdoings, as seen in The Flighting of Loki, which is an old Norse poem that can be read online. In addition to being bound for all time, both Loki and Prometheus were doomed to be attacked continuously by animals, Loki a snake that dripped venom onto his face, and Prometheus an eagle that goes for the liver. Tantalus, meanwhile, was bound neck deep in a river unable to ever drink from it, nor eat from the fruit dangling above. The punishments of all three, I think most would agree, is rather disproportionate, at least for the two Greek figures. Both Loki and Prometheus are additionally associated with fire, which as a demon, Crowley has both access and immunity to. Iris, being the personification of the rainbow, could be said to have associations with him simply due to the rainbow itself being a symbol of LGBT plus people but she also encouraged feminist protests, worked against those who committed perjury, and transformed a human into a goddess herself, purely so that she might be reunited with her husband. She's associated with Raphael, meanwhile, for the winged staff that she carries in addition to her own wings, and it being an intercessor for human prayers, which is something that Catholics believe of saints. Buddha, of course, is known for wisdom. Anubis is called the master of secrets and has a serpent for a daughter and ancient Egyptians believed Thoth to be the author of all knowledge. He is specifically credited with a lengthy list of subjects, among them astronomy, botany, theology, and reading and writing. I quite like the idea that Crowley might have helped to develop writing for Aziraphale when he learned of his love of stories. The angel with which Raphael is most often associated in Islam is named Israfil, to the point where many people believe them to be the same being. Israfil is mentioned in the Quran as the angel of the horn or trumpet responsible for signalling the coming of Judgment Day, and in the UK at least, a horn is a somewhat antiquated slang term for a phone. Raphael features in the Book of Tobit, which can be found in Catholic and Orthodox as well as some Anglican Bibles, and in which God sends him, disguised as a human, to heal Tobit, guide his son Tobias, and free his cousin Sarah from the demon of lust Asmodeus. The latter's name is uttered by Israfil in episode 3. While disguised as a human, Raphael uses the name Azarius, which also supports the angel Sona theory, as well as the slightly lesser seen theory that Crowley and Aziraphale used to be a part of the same being, just as the characters were split after the original short story. Raphael is often seen in stained glass or other art with children, usually Tobias, but he's also shown with red hair and grey or black wings. People tend to think of angels as having white wings and demons as having black, but in fact, a lot of sources and works of art show a great variety of colours among angels. Uh, if I remember correctly, Michaels are meant to be green. 
I like to think that the traditional two colours simply come from a zero felon Crowley being the representatives most often seen on Earth. Um, this could also explain the stereotypical view of what most people would call a cherub with the blonde curls, particularly since the angels that guarded the gates of Eden were said to be cherubs. Some theologians believe they have identified other biblical appearances of Raphael in which he goes unnamed, almost always on missions of healing. He's said to have been the original guardian of the Tree of Life in Eden, which is particularly interesting when you consider the French dub of the show, as recently translated by Stray Miles on Twitter, in which Aziraphale states that Crowley was the one on apple tree duty in episode 6. The Tree of Life is actually a different tree to the one that Adam and Eve ate from, but equally as forbidden. So it could be that both Aziraphale and Crowley had a tree entrusted to them, which could even be said to be representative of things they had to achieve over time. Aziraphale had the tree of knowledge and had to learn and accept things that are presented as good or evil and not necessarily strictly that way at all. And Crowley had to draw Aziraphale out of his indoctrination and thus gift to him a free life of his own. The tree of life, according to some, represents all that is good and of God, whereas the tree of knowledge represents the opposite, so they would each have guarded their opposite as they guard each other. Crowley then going on to tempt others to eat from the latter could also then be symbolic of his fall. Raphael is named in several other Jewish apocryphal books in addition to the one already mentioned, as well as in the Book of Enoch, which feels a little like a weird fever dream to read, but it's all online if anyone ever feels the need. In it, Raphael is called the Angel of the Spirits of Men, and it's his business to heal the earth which the angels have defiled. Later on, it states that both Raphael and Michael are astonished at the severity of the flood judgment. When Raphael is mentioned, it's more often than not with the word Archangel attached. He's said to guard pilgrims, and some images of him bear more than a passing resemblance to images of St. Christopher, the patron saint of travellers. Raphael is in fact a saint in his own right, along with Michael and Gabriel, and they're also the only three angels specifically named in the Bible. The fact that Raphael appears in the Bible at all could be seen as evidence against him being Crowley, since he appears not to have fallen, but we know that Crowley remained capable of miracles and good deeds and spent some time trying to convince Aziraphale to form the arrangement, which could indicate some level of eagerness to perform more under the guise of laziness. He could also just as easily have given his own old name in a panic rather than make one up. As the Archangel of Healing, Raphael's patronage understandably includes a lot of health and medicine related things, but also marriage, lovers, guardian angels, happy meetings, nightmares, travellers and young people. A lot of New Age sources associate colours, gems, days of the week and all manner of things with various angels for no apparent reason, at least not to me, but Raphael's gem list includes serpentine. The others are agate, opal and yellow topaz. Raphael's colours are listed as red, orange, yellow, grey, black and green. His symbol is said to be an eight-pointed star, uh, which is known as the Star of Redemption and is used to represent baptism, uh, which is why a lot of fonts have octagonal bases. It also has associations in Islam with time, and Crowley is the only character shown in the universe to have any real measure of control over time. He is associated with the left arm, and we all know that Crowley is almost always seen on Aziraphale's left side. Or is he? There's a traditional rhyme of protection that uses the words To my right Michael and to my left Gabriel, in front of me Uriel and behind me Raphael. If we take a look at this scene and think of Sandofen as Gabriel's representative or minion, since they're so often seen together and Sandofen seems to be used as some kind of enforcer, this order is reversed because this is an invocation for protection and they're attacking him. Uh, but Raphael, if he is Crowley, is still very much behind Aziraphale. And finally, for those of you missing out on the astronomy panel, Raphael is said to rule over the planet Mercury and a specific list of stars, um, including Aldebaran, which is an orange giant in Taurus, Rigel and Bellatrix, um, which are both blue and in Orion, Capella, which is in Auriga, and which is the brightest yellow star in the sky, aside from the sun, Polaris, a yellow-white star in Gemini, and Spica, a blue-white giant in Virgo. So why show the Carina Nebula on screen, you ask, and not one of these stars? Well, the Carina Nebula contains a structure known as the Defiant Finger. I rest my case. <laughs>